Welcome back to DBD TV. Now with less Unmei no He in the intro. I'm continuing to cover the animated version of the Cell Arc, material exclusive to that adaptation. Obviously, this is the second part of a two part video, so you might want to check that one out. And if you're looking for my overall analysis of the main story and characters, that was covered when I reviewed the manga. So let's get right back to where I left off. I left off with the Trunks special. Speaking of it, Episode 164 does something pretty weird. This episode aired on November 11th, 1992, over three months before the animated Trunks special, but two months after Toriyama's Trunks The Story. As I mentioned when I covered that back in 2018, Toriyama's own notes for that chapter state that he knew at the time that it was going to be adapted for animation. For some reason, I guess Toei couldn't wait that long, so they kinda preempted themselves. Episode 164 features an extended flashback of Trunks' experiences in his own time. It's the first glimpse animated Dragon Ball gets of his younger and Gohan's older character designs. Interestingly, Trunks has his sword during this period, while in Trunks the story and the special, he is only shown to use it just prior to his time traveling. It's an odd little extra glimpse into Trunks' world, but it doesn't really contradict anything. Or at least it wouldn't. See, the main story is never really explicit about the fate of Yajirobe. In Trunks' initial exposition, he specifically refers to the killings of Kuririn, Yamcha, Tenshinhan, Chaozu, Piccolo, and Vegeta. And that's what the Trunks special shows as well, although it's a little ambiguous with Chaozu, showing his involvement but not his death. Interestingly, episode 164 omits Chaozu entirely and replaces him with Yajirobe, showing that he was, in fact, killed by the artificial humans. That's a big assumption, not supported by any real evidence, but nothing contradicts it either. Then, the animated Dragon Ball Super comes along and shows that Yajirobe was, in fact, not killed by the artificial humans. Well, well, well. That said, Super possibly acknowledges this random moment with Yajirobe correcting Trunks that he was only mostly dead. Any problems aside, it is rather fitting that 164 is so focused on events related to the Trunks special. The Trunks special would prove to be the last installment of the series with animation supervised by Maeda Minoru, Dragon Ball's character designer and lead animator since the very beginning and 164 itself would be the last regular episode he supervised. In case you've forgotten, Maeda headed up Studio Junio, the first animation studio we covered in DBD TV. That studio, with Maeda at the helm, animated the very first episode of Dragon Ball. As I mentioned when I covered the animated Frieza arc, episodes from Studio Junio became rarer and rarer as Maeda's resources were shifted to handling the movies. Maeda only supervised five episodes this arc, including the Trunks special. Only the first of those, 124, was also credited to Studio Junio. The other instances credit no studio at all, with key animators increasingly found on Toei's own staff roles. One of those animators, Nakatsuru Katsuyoshi, would officially take over the role of character designer starting with episode 200, the first episode of the Boo arc. Likewise, Shindo Pro's new supervisor, Yamamuro Tadayoshi, would assume the role of animation supervisor for the movies, starting with Movie 8. The departure of Maeda Minoru and Studio Junio represents perhaps the biggest shift in the production of Dragon Ball Z's animation. It's a shame to see them go, as they frequently produce some of the best-looking episodes. But the new names taking Maeda's place also coincide with a huge turnaround in the overall caliber of the look of the show. I spent quite a bit of time in the Frieza arc lamenting what I perceived as a vast downgrade in the art and animation quality during that period. Here's where things start to turn around, in my admittedly layman's eyes. Shindo Mitsuo stepped down from supervising Shindo Pro. Those duties went to, as I said, Yamamuro Tadayoshi. Today I feel that name is associated with everything that's wrong with modern Dragon Ball art and animation. While the guy gets a lot of flack for his output nowadays, he did some great work back in the 90s. I think it was a huge step up, moving Shindo Pro from a good studio to one of the top tier. Segasha continued rotating between Shimanuki Masahiro and Hisada Kazuya as supervisors, and as far as I'm concerned, that studio started getting good again. You know, roughly after the driving episode. I'm never going to be a fan of the exaggerated way their characters move, 
but at least I can give them credit for ceasing to draw characters that look like giant cavemen, or whatever this was supposed to be. Toei came on board and did a few more episodes in-house, including episode 120, which I feel is one of the best-looking episodes of the series. And that was helmed by Nakatsuru, so I have no problem with him taking over the character designer spot. This is one of those really unfortunate placements where Studio Live was slotted to do the next episode, literally reanimating some of the same shots, so you can see what a downgrade in quality it is. Yeah, it's not all good news. Studio Live remained just as bad as it ever was, although even they could eke out some decent moments when Kano Toshiyuki was drawing keyframes. However, the real disaster in the Cell arc was Last House. By this point in the series, Uchiyama Masayuki seemed to have pretty much lost all but one of his regular key animators, forcing him to step in and pick up the slack. The results are not impressive, I'm sorry to say. Remember that I stated at the very beginning that I liked Last House. It was never the best, but I thought it was usually a simple but effective art style with relatively fluid animation. They helmed the very first episode of Dragon Ball Z. It pains me to have to say this, but from this point on, they consistently put out the ugliest material in the series. So much of it is not only hideous to look at, but it omits practically every detail they could get away with. If you've seen a memeable Dragon Ball Z image, chances are it's from this era of Last House. Given that Last House animated 18 of the 77 episodes of this arc, no character escapes unscathed, but I don't think anyone has it worse than poor Cell. It's as if Uchiyama had a personal mission to prove that Cell was not, in fact, perfect after all. I could literally fill this screen with terrible Cell drawings. I didn't even know it was possible for Cell to look like he has a mullet. But here we are. Finally, though, Toei subcontracted two other studios towards the end of the Cell arc to join the regular animation rotation. I don't really have much to say about Studio Carpenter, and that's neither good nor bad. They've never left much of an impression on me, but that also means that they don't screw up either. It looks like Dragon Ball, which it's supposed to. The animation is fine enough. If they have any distinctive quirk, it's that it occasionally seems like they draw pupils a bit too big for the eyes, but that's pretty small potatoes. The other new studio was Studio Cockpit, and they're awesome. They very much stand out, and in the best way. The art is highly detailed, the characters are amazingly expressive, and I think it moves very well. Despite sometimes taking some big liberties translating Toriyama's art to the screen, Studio Cockpit shines, and I would definitely say they're my favorite studio from the later years of Dragon Ball. Finally, a studio called Doga Kobo, who typically handled in-between animations, supervised one episode of Dragon Ball Z, here in this arc. And it's... satisfactory, but weird looking. Last House and Studio Live definitely dragged down the overall quality, but with other veteran studios improving, and the introduction of new studios allowing the workload to be spread more fairly, Dragon Ball Z looks infinitely better at the end of this arc than it did by the end of the Frieza arc. Just like with Vegeta and Bluma, the anime tends to excel at fleshing out character moments that the manga glosses over. That's no exception when it comes to its villains. Number 16, number 17, and number 18 get a few more chances to behave like hooligans before they're replaced. Number 16 finds himself so covered in animals, he might as well be a Disney princess. Cell, however, really gets to shine. I've said that he slinks into the manga in creepy fashion, but that we see so little of him after that introduction that the menace starts to fade. Thankfully, this Cell doesn't get that chance. Here we get many more vignettes of eerily empty clothing, Cell becomes a slasher movie villain chasing lovers through funhouse mirrors, always staying one step ahead no matter how fast his victims run. Kuririn stumbles into a fun action set piece, saving others and living up to his role as the stalwart but relatable everyman. Cell has gained so much he even gains two fingers on each hand. Yep, similar to Piccolo, first form Cell has three digits in the manga, but five in the anime. He also gains a lot of attacks he doesn't typically use in the manga. I like this, as it accentuates his connection to the characters. Quite frankly, it makes a much greater impression for him to use the Makan Kosapo against Piccolo, a move we've only ever seen Piccolo do, as opposed to the Kamehameha, which is so widely and publicly known. Granted, sometimes the anime seems to fudge which characters Cell is made from. At one point, Kuririn claims Cell is made from him to punctuate how much he wants to destroy the gestating Cell. 
Cell uses the Shishin no Ken, which the characters attribute to Ten Shinhan cells. Then again, in the same episode, Cell uses a move that Kuririn and Yamcha claim as a combination of their Kienzan and Sokidan, only for Kaio to identify it as Frieza's controllable discs. I don't know if they're trying to use that as an out, the characters can claim whatever is convenient for the plot, but it's not actually a writing mistake because other characters could theoretically dispute them. After all, in the animated series, Piccolo has been shown to split himself into multiple people too. Cell does have his cells, so even though nobody makes that correction, I guess it's fine. But basically, Cell can pull out whatever move he wants. However, Cell lost a little something too. Respect. In my latest example demonstrating that non-English speakers don't necessarily possess the expertise to transcribe English-based words, Dr. Garrow's computer informs us that Fleeza was used to facilitate the creation of the world's most horrifying villain, Sal. Actually, you know what? Sal is what I'm calling this guy from now on. Sal, quality bootleg action figure for enjoyment of kids and other children. Hours of power nutrition sucking through tail. Perfection to be stimulated by future to the backing. That said, animated Cell gains something the manga version could never hope to attain. Let me see if I can sum it up in one utterance. <laughs> yes, it's Wakamoto Norio, who I say is almost as iconic in the role of Cell as Nakao Ryuse is as Frieza. While I still don't think Cell is that great of a character, Wakamoto's portrayal elevates him considerably. From his guttural man bug to his suave bug man, Wakamoto adds much needed charisma and terror to this sometimes underwhelming genetic freak show of a main villain. Another voice actor who really gets to shine this time around is Gordy Daisuke. He had been attached to the franchise from practically the beginning, playing many relatively minor roles. His two most persistent were Umigame, the Sea Turtle, and Gyumao, the Ox Demon King. Here, though, he gets to join up with Frieza as the Great King Cold. And while that's certainly a decent enough resume, as well as a great range, it's not until the end of the arc that he is cast as perhaps his most famous role in Dragon Ball. Mr. Satan. This seems to be the role he was born to play, as he packs the character full of equal parts bluster, machismo, and cowardice. It took quite a long time, but the wait was certainly worth it. Speaking of oral sensitivity, the Cell arc sees a return of insert songs to a degree I'd argue hadn't been heard since the Red Ribbon Army arc. Trunks' killing of Frieza is punctuated by Battle Point Unlimited, which is probably best known for its Seinfeld-esque slap bass line that just screams 90s. A bit later, when Trunks has a flashback forward to his future where apparently everyone carries his sword, we're treated to Mind Power Energy, a duet between Kageyama Hironobu and Yuka. But I just think of it as the Whoa song. It's okay. Finally, episode 184 uses what is perhaps the most iconic insert song for one of its most iconic moments. It's everyone's favorite insert song, Day of Destiny, Spirit vs. Spirit. You want Kageyama singing his heart out? You want overblown and overwrought savior imagery? You want... the opening song I used for this arc until the powers that be persuaded me not to? This is the one. I can't tell you how increasingly sad I became the more comments I received from people asking what my intro song was. I try my best to leave my feelings of the American dub out of my review series, but it pained me to realize how many English-speaking Dragon Ball fans had been deprived of this song, apparently never having heard it before my videos. I figured at least Team 4 Star managed to bridge that gap. How about, in no particular order, we run down a list of a few of the added corrections or added mistakes this arc brings into the TV-verse. Trunks no longer specifies number 19 and number 20 as the artificial humans who destroy his future. To correct the manga plot hole, he doesn't provide any designation. The Great King Cold is stated to be stronger than Frieza, further complicating his role in the story. Goku is shown to hand off the Senzu to Bluma before they head down to the island, explaining why he doesn't have them later on. Still not sure why he dumped them in the first place. Kuririn does come up with the idea of having Goku use his instantaneous movement to find Cell. Then Goku shows up that way to serve as a punchline, and it's never mentioned again. Here's a rather infamous one. Gohan kills eight Cell Juniors despite Cell only creating seven of them. Gohan tells Cardin it's nice to see him again rather than acting like they've never met before. 
The Muten Roshi recaps the history of the Tenkaichi Budokai. He claims the 22nd Budokai took place five years after the 21st, when it was actually only three years. He also says that the Budokai has not been held since Ma Jr. destroyed the area. As I mentioned in the Boo arc, that would later be rendered inaccurate, as the 24th Budokai would be placed just before these events. Given the abundance of flashbacks in this version of the arc, it really seems to be celebrating the past. And that goes beyond old footage. Dracula Man, or someone who looks like him, has joined the Lords of the Highway Biker Gang who harassed the artificial humans. How the mighty have fallen, but none so far as Tao Pai Pai who returns for two episodes. Sadly, it's no longer his original voice actor. While he retains his cyborg power-ups, he functions primarily as a comedic obstacle for Gohan and later Goku. We find him working for unscrupulous people attempting to enrich themselves in the panic after Cell's announcement. The first is named Bourbon, the second is Vodka. Vodka and his henchmen also carry this nostalgia torch because they look like Ponputo's manager and his henchmen from Filler in the 22nd Budokai. Honestly, I don't really care for the first of these two episodes. It focuses on a girl named Lime, and she gets on my nerves. She falls in a river and Gohan saves her, only for her to be kind of a jerk about it, because Gohan accidentally touches her chest while doing so. Hey, remember that moment in Jurassic Park when Dr. Grant is pulling Lex away from raptors and has to grab her by the butt to keep her from getting munched on? Remember the scene after that where Lex gets mad and calls him a pervert? Oh wait, that never happened because that would be stupid! I really wish Gohan had said, you know what, we'll just drop you right back in there and we'll do this as many times as it takes for me to save your life in a way you're satisfied with. Much more entertaining is Tao Pai Pai tricking Goku into solving locking ring puzzles in exchange for Dragon Balls when it's really just an opportunity to distract Goku so they can escape with the prize. Even the poor henchman assigned to watch him, who is literally called Henchman A, isn't in on it and tries to help him with the puzzle. The whole thing is hilarious with a wonderful payoff. The show continues to dig into its past by revealing unseen elements of its history. Chi Chi decides to celebrate Gohan's 11th birthday. Even though it's not his birthday, she figures he missed one while in the Room of Spirit and Time. The resulting festivities bring up memories of Gohan as a baby, explaining how he got his name. After the baby rejects Chi Chi's ideas of Einstein and other geniuses, as well as Gumo's list of goo puns, Goku and Chi-Chi get into an argument over Goku's incessant hunger. When she screams the word breakfast, which in Japanese is Asa Gohan, the baby reacts positively, and they realize he should be named after Goku's grandfather. Likewise, we learn that the battle against Raditz, or even Garlic Jr., is not the first time Goku spots glimpses of Gohan's power. A runaway stroller incident forces baby Gohan to blast his way through a tree. Honestly, I don't care for this. Going back to the well too many times diminishes the impact. Retroactively plopping Garlic Jr. into the animated continuity feels redundant, but at this point it seems ridiculous for Goku to show any surprise at Gohan's hidden powers against Raditz, because apparently this stuff was happening all the time! Coming into the final act of the storyline, it too needs its own reliable filler cutaways. <sighs> Because of that, we get Karoni, Piroshki, and Pisa. And I hate them so incredibly much. If you've been following Dragon Ball Dissection in order, you'll remember that when I covered the Cell arc, my ultimate assessment of the character of Mr. Satan as he was used there was that he is a bit of a one-note gag, but ultimately used sparingly enough so as not to become insufferable. Well, throw that assessment out the window with this version. Karoni and Piroshki are said to be Mr. Satan's top students. Pisa is Mr. Satan's manager. They arrive just before Mr. Satan is to fight Cell, so the two flamboyant protégés can do it in his place. Obviously, they fail miserably, so Mr. Satan must step up after all. And that's fine. It allows the series to extend the Mr. Satan shenanigans into a full episode when his solo attempt at a challenge would not have taken very long. I can live with that. But then they don't leave. They no longer have anything unique to add to the story, but they take up space anyway. Karoni and Piroshki are just store brand versions of Mr. Satan, and Pisa serves up a bootleg rendition of the same hype as the announcer. Because this is the anime and it needs to kill time, we get far more Mr. Satan cutaways where he can whine in various ways that this is all a trick. That would be bad enough on its own, 
But on top of that, those added annoyances are presented to us with twice as many people involved. Episode 191 is a big episode for many reasons. It's where Cell dies, it's animated by Studio Cockpit, it's the first episode to use music from the Broly movie, but it's probably just as well known for the major alteration it makes to the end of the battle. In the manga, Gohan struggles against Cell until Vegeta launches his own blast. The distraction is enough for Gohan to overpower Cell. However, in the TV series, Piccolo, Tenshin Han, Yamcha, and finally Kuririn jump in before that and fire their own blasts at Cell. Cell is able to hold all four of them off without much problem, but they keep getting up no matter how many times they're knocked down. Finally, Vegeta jumps in, and the fight concludes in the same way. I'm of two minds about this. Vegeta's attack works as a strategy because what he does is unexpected. It's a tiny thing that draws Cell's attention from where it should be focused. Now that intervention no longer feels as much of a surprise, and it certainly shouldn't to Cell. Why is this one random hit enough to throw him off his stride when he's been effortlessly dealing with a non-stop barrage from five other people? On the other hand, Vegeta's role in the original has never really left much of an impression on me. It just kind of happens. It's a nice character moment for him, but it could have been anybody. This addition adds much more emotional weight. It gives the other characters something to do, even though they seemingly accomplish nothing. But each of them individually reflects on his own relationship with Goku and Gohan, and why they feel it's necessary to now stand up and contribute what they can. As what seemingly marks Goku's exit from the story, this feels momentous and necessary. I love it for that. And if you want to be generous, you could argue that it's the combined amount of distractions that become too much for Cell to deal with, making all of them necessary. I just feel as though this could have used some restructuring to sell that idea better. As it stands, it's exactly the way the manga does it, but with some other stuff thrown on top of it, and together they don't really mesh. Continuing to the end, the body count between manga and anime is a little bit different. The old man killed by number 17's pistol at the very end of the arc gets a reprieve in the animated version. But of course, Gregory is added to the casualty list since he exists in this continuity. We get to see future future Bluma in close-up rather than just a teeny tiny sketch. My annoyance with lack of thought to time travel shenanigans reaches its peak here at the end of the story when, after cutting away from Goku and Kaio in heaven, the narrator literally says, elsewhere at around the same time, to refer to Trunks arriving in the future. Dude, that is the literal definition of not the same time. So that's the animated Cell arc. Oh, one more thing. When I covered the original version of this, I claimed that this was the only arc that Kintone does not appear in. Many of you reminded me that it also does not appear in the 22nd Budokai arc. As long as I'm cleaning up loose ends, might as well do this too. So that's the animated Cell arc. The pacing can still be something of a drag, the filler can sometimes add problems. It's not quite, say, the Cyan arc where the animated version straight up supercharges almost everything. But I'd be lying if I said it didn't improve on a lot of my biggest issues. Just like Gohan's added development in that arc, I'd almost say the improvements made to Vegeta's role are required to appreciate the story. And regardless of the unevenness of some of the added material, it's hard to deny the overall product is a huge step up from the lowest points of the Frieza arc. With most of this, I get a whiff of creativity, rather than the stench of desperation. With Goku dead and Kaio giving up on building a new house on the Serpentine Road, they head off in search of new adventures, which leads us into another anime-only storyline, the Ano Yoichi Budokai arc. It's another tournament, but this time all the fighters are already dead. So we're going to check back in with Television Dragon Ball one more time to close out our DBD TV detour. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this look back. This channel persists largely because of viewer support. If you are able, I hope you will do wonderful things like engage with this video or become a patron to enjoy early content and other benefits. I'll see you next time!